Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay, everyone. Uh, for those who come to hear the Google Hangout, we've got uh, a guest again, uh, Joe. And uh, Joe, it's good to have you. Hey, thanks, Andy. How's it going? Thanks, Jason. Um, I think um, I'm glad to come on, uh, and you know, I, <clears throat> I hope that. Uh, we can do this more and we can try and understand each other and, and build br genuine bridges and genuine friendship uh, and I hope that whatever's been said between us or uh, some sections of the atheist community I just hope that we can build some bridges uh, so that's what I hope to get out of this and to, to see what you have to say okay sure that sounds good to me alright I'm just going to pray Joe I hope you don't mind no, no, sir. Go right ahead. And uh, Joe's only got uh, about thirty minutes, so so if he if he has to go, that's why he has to go. <clears throat> Father, we just come before you today, and we thank you for this day. And Lord, we just come to you, and we just pray you be in this conversation. And I just pray you bless Joe, Lord, what whatever he's doing later on, just be with him and his family and, and be today. So Lord, we commit this time to you in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay, Joe, you're very brave. Come into a read a, a, a chapter of the Bible. So do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it? Well, you can read it. Uh, I, well, I figured, like I said, you know, since this is our first real one, I figured I'd rather let you choose the topic, and this way, you know, something you're more comfortable with, and then we can go from there in the future. You know. Okay. Well, well I'm reading uh, from the. Um, from the uh, New Living Translation. I normally use the King James, but it's more easy, easy English. <coughs> sorry, I'm coughing. Which I'm sorry, which version are you using? I'm I'm, I'm I'm I got Bible Gateway open. I'm going to read along. I'm going to watch along as you read. Okay, I'm using uh, the New Living Translation. <coughs> Excuse me, New Living Translation. Ah, I found it. Thank you. Uh, and normally I use the King James. Uh, <coughs> easy, re easy to read uh, in English really it says listen so Proverbs chapter 8 listen as wisdom calls out hear as our understanding raises her voice on the hilltop along the road she takes her stand at the crossroads by the gates at the entrance to the town on the road leading in she cries aloud I call to you to all of you I raise my voice to all people you simple people, use good judgment. You foolish people, show some understanding. Listen to me, for I have important things to tell you. Everything I say is right, for I speak the truth and detest every kind of deception. My advice is wholesome. There is nothing devious or crooked in it. My words are plain to anyone with understanding, clear to those with knowledge. Choose my own rather than silver and knowing knowledge rather than pure gold for wisdom is far more valuable than rubies nothing you desire can compare with it I wisdom live together with good judgment and I know where to discover knowledge and discernment all who fear the Lord will hate evil therefore I hate pride and arrogance corruption and perverse speech common sense and success belong to me insight and strength are mine because of me kings reign and rulers make just decrees Rulers lead with my help, and nobles make righteous judgments. I love all who love me, and those who search will surely find me. I have riches and honor, as well as enduring wealth and justice. My gifts are better than gold, even the purest gold. My wage is better than sterling silver. I walk in righteousness, in paths of justice. Those who love me inherit, I will find the treasure. The Lord formed me from the beginning before he created anything else. I was appointed in ages past. At the very first, before the earth began, I was born before the oceans were created, before the springs bubbled forth their waters. <coughs> Excuse me. Before the mountains were formed, before the hills, I was born. Before he had made the earth and fields and the, fe and, and the first handf handfuls of soil, 
I was there when he established the heavens and when he drew the horizons on the oceans. I was there when he set the clouds above and when he established springs deep in the earth. I was there when he set the limits of the seas so they would not spread beyond their boundaries and when he marked off the earth's foundations. I was the architect at his side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence and how happy I was with the world he created, how I rejoiced with the human family, and so my children listen to me, for all who follow my ways are joyful. Listen to my instruction and be wise, don't ignore it. Joyful are those who listen to me, watching for me daily at my gates, waiting for me outside my home, for whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But those who miss me injure themselves, all who hate me love death. <clears throat> so that's Proverbs chapter 8, and it's a very, like, if you're studying like Proverbs, it's like a really kind of well-known uh, chapter for those who, who, who would study the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So I, I got two questions, really. One is, what's your journey as an atheist? Like, what's your background, and why are you an atheist? And then secondly, what are your feelings or thoughts about this chapter? Well, I would say that relates to your name. Yeah, as far as, as far as my journey, I, mean, I started out actually uh, as a child, <clears throat> you know, very much in the church. I uh, was raised uh, Roman Catholic, and um, I, when I was very young, I, I very much liked the church, and I uh, used to go all the time. And when I was six, I decided I wanted to be an altar boy, but I was too young. So I had to, uh, but so I went to altar boy practice anyway <laughs> for two years before I could actually participate in, in you know, being officially an altar boy. So, but I, I went to all the practices and, and learned everything they had to had to learn. I was very much excited for it, and um, I want to say I did that for, you know, I guess till I was thirteen or so, and uh, <clears throat> but over time. You know, I started to get, uh, you know, disenamored with the church. I mean, our, my church started announcing, you know, how much money they were taking every week. And we weren't doing any of the things that we taught, like, that were being taught. I mean, most people that go to, like, a Catholic to Catholic church, you know, there's very much a, oh, talk about hell and, 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 and all the, you know, scaring you into trying to be a good person. And... My church didn't do that so much. It was more of, it was, I mean, it was talked about to be sure, but it was really more of a focus on, on the positive side. So uh, I always call it like, you know, from a, from a Catholic, Catholic perspective, like fluffy Jesus. It was, it was all the happy stuff, and yeah, hell was there, uh, but, you know, it certainly was talked about, but, but it was really more of, like, you know, the, like, the, the positive aspects. So. But then when I started to learn about, you know, the history of the church and things that were done, you know, the selling of indulgences and the Crusades and the Inquisition and things like that. And, like I said, you know, they were teaching us that, you know, we, we were supposed to give and help others and all that, which is, you know, a good thing. And I still believe that those are good things. And they were teaching us about compassion and about forgiveness and, and, and having, you know, redemption both in the spiritual sense and also in the in the corporeal sense that, you know, that we, we all make mistakes, but if we're, if we're sincere and we try to make up for our errors, that we should be given the opportunity to, to uh, make amends and, 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 you know, be better next time. And, and those things, I think, I, are still, I still hold on to. Um, but we weren't actually doing anything. You know, we were telling us, yes, we have to help the poor, and, we, and our church did nothing to help and we have to help the infirm and we did nothing to help the infirm and so we were giving you all these messages on how to be a moral person and the church was then not demonstrating any of these values they were teaching me and that that conflicted me and then at one point I had to go to the rectory um, I don't know you, you, you may know how the way the Catholic Church works but basically you usually have one or two local priests and then the other priests rotate in coming from other areas within the diocese because they're trying to at least, in, at least I it was in the early 70s, early to mid 70s because they were trying to um, uh, and, and I guess early 80s too to, to try to uh, 
you know, give the priest better experience, you know, uh, kind of uh, give a sense of connection with other other parishes and the diocese and so forth, and bring a different perspective, so was it, was the churches wouldn't get stale. And um, so I had to deliver some things down there, and when I went in, and the priests were living in this really opulent settings that were really better than where I lived. And I mean, we were middle class, but you know, we, you know, we weren't living poor by any stretch of the imagination. But I walked in, and I was just kind of blown away. And here they were telling us about how much money they were collecting each week, and I realized where it was going. You know, it was going to statuary and and to to finery for the for the priests and, and to these opulent living settings and, and not to actually live up to all the values that they taught me. Mm. So at that point I just I just felt that well I can't I can't keep coming here. I didn't I didn't become an atheist but I, I, I gave up on at least the Catholic Church at that time. And um, I guess I still nominally considered myself Catholic, but I, I kind of did it from a distance. I was kind of like on my own. And um, you know, occasionally I would still go to go to church here or there if I was with people that were going to go to church. But over time, I just felt that that I still believed that there was a God, but I felt that humans had kind of lost their way. That that whatever God had actually said. Humans had gotten it confused and messed up. Um, and then, as I started to, you know, go beyond, uh, you know, my own little corner of the world, as I started to travel and meet, you know, I went to college and, and I went to other places and met people from elsewhere, and I started to encounter other kinds of Christians and start to talk about, you know, the, uh, theological uh, things, and then really finding out how much how different a lot of those other teachings were because you know as a as a kid I never understood the whole Catholic Protestant uh, you know the, the, you know all the conflict because I felt well they they believe in Jesus we believe in Jesus what's the difference and then I come to find well there's there's actually some substantial differences uh, between the two and and even there and even within certainly within Protestantism there's, there's obviously you know many many different uh, sects and and they teach different things and I I had never experienced all that and so the more I experienced the the less sense that it all made to me that there's all these different factions and they all you know even if they have the same core belief that there's all this other stuff on it and I just really felt like wow humans have really made a hash of this you know that whatever whatever you know whatever's really there humans have just really messed this up so badly that you know we hate each other and we have wars and, and all this and that kind of pushed me further and further away from religion so I got to the point where you know I wasn't just divorced from the Catholic Church I was really divorced from any any form of organized religion and I really was hostile to it even though I was still nominally a believer Mm. Um, and uh, the thing is, you know, the, and the further I got away from it, it's like anything. You know, if you're in something for a long time, you, you don't always see its flaws. But when you take a step back, you know, it's easier to see. You know, just like we always, we, it's very easy to notice the flaws in other people. It's harder to notice them in, the, in ourselves because you know we're too much into it. And if we step back from ourselves, you know, we can see things. And I really there was there's things within the Bible that just never made sense to me. Yeah. And for instance, and I, I and I'm not I'm, I don't remember which gospel is, this is in, so you'll, you'll probably know. Um, but okay, in, in one of the gospels, at, at when when Jesus is crucified at the end, he says it is accomplished. Okay, that makes sense because obviously you know. According to according to what it says is that he was here for for a mission. You know, he had a purpose and he, and he came and he completed it. And then there's one of the other gospels where it says, you know, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense that a, you know, if he's you know fully fully you know, even if I understand the whole you know fully man and fully God, but the fact that he, if he came here for a mission and he was fulfilling that mission, it doesn't make sense to me. That he would say something like that because he would, what, why would he ever think he was being forsaken? Because that was that was why he was here. You know, they, the whole idea is he's supposed to die for, you know, to to, to be you know, to substitute himself as a sacrifice to 
you know, to, to close the old covenant, to get rid of the blood sacrifice, so that humans could could you know get into and you know, be able to get to heaven. And so it didn't really make sense to me, and and so I, I struggled with that for a long time, and and then as I you know, learn more and more about the Bible and about how the whole idea of Jesus being God as opposed to just being the prophet of God, how how that kind of happened, I kind of came to the conclusion, well, maybe not a conclusion, but I kind of started to feel that, well, maybe maybe he was sent by God, but he wasn't actually God himself, you know, because he, he doesn't actually ever say that he was, and it's implied, but, um, you know, and so that, so then I started stepping further away and you know, it eventually just reached a point where I guess it would kind of surprise me because um, I was watching somebody talk about the Bible and talk about stuff that it says, and and it was stuff that I wasn't familiar with because, like, you know, Catholic, you know, Catholicism, you're not encouraged to read the Bible. You're encouraged to go to church and let the let the priest tell you what it says. Um, so as I started, you know, hearing this and someone saying, well, this is what it says, and I was like, well, I can't, it doesn't say that, and then I would go look it up, you know, like Bible Gateway or something like that, and say, geez, it really does say that, and the more I would hear these things, they would, I find just irreconcilable with, you know, reality that I just reached a point where I was like, well, I, I really can't believe this stuff anymore, so it was a very long process, it took, you know, 30 years, really, yeah. To to uh, to really come to where I'm at, and even there, once I once I stopped believing, I had um, you know you when you go through, you go through like a lot of us go through like this phase where we're we get kind of angry because you know, we feel that you know people lied to us and so forth and so on, and I think that's something that you unfortunately encountered. Too. Is that there's a lot of atheists that get angry about it, and then they kind of take it out on people, and they want to make fun of believers uh, because they're really just angry at themselves for having believed it. <laughs> I think it's what it really goes down to, and so they take out the frustrations on on others. And I'm I'm past that. I'm past that. And so now I'm kind of like, well, you know, I want to talk. I'd rather talk to people, and it doesn't mean I'm going to be a believer, but I could at least I could we, you know you and I can talk, and we can we can we can share discussion even if we don't agree. So that's how I got to where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you uh, sharing your journey, uh, Joel. Uh, so, are, are, are we any thoughts on Proverbs chapter eight? Oh, on chapter eight. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, I think as far uh, as far as what it's saying, I mean, it, it's written obviously from the perspective of wisdom as, as wisdom personified. And you know, I guess I'd say I, I agree with I agree with the sentiment certainly that that wisdom is more valuable than gold. It is more more valuable than silver and, and rubies and all that. And that you know, if if we don't have wisdom, you know, we make foolish uh, choices, and we'll do foolish things, uh, sometimes even harmful and hurtful things. And but if we're wise, then we won't be prideful, we won't be arrogant. Um, and yeah, because I do think arrogance is a, is a, is a terrible, uh, uh, destructive human impulse. Um, and pride can certainly be destructive. So yeah, I think, I think wisdom... And the problem, the sad part, the bad part about it is that, you know, it takes usually takes time for us to, to gain wisdom and by the time we do, usually we're we're old, and we we missed out on all that uh, opportunity to, to apply wisdom when we were younger that we didn't, because we didn't have it. You know, we weren't capable of being wise. Mm. And uh, we look back now, and like I look, I'm I'm I don't know how old you are, Jason. I'm 46, and I look back at you know many mistakes I made in my life and, and things that I, I wish I could do over, but I can't. Mm. Thank you for that. Um. I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, in the Enlightenment, uh, in the time of Immanuel Kant and you, um, and then coming into the uh, 19th century and up into the early 20th century, there was a principal emphasis about knowledge and that knowledge is, is rational, that it's objective and rational. But here, <clears throat> there's an emphasis on wisdom which is more practical 
and uh, I think that's an interesting uh, if you turn if we go to uh, Proverbs chapter 1 um, it says <clears throat> Uh, verse 1, it says, There are Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Uh, their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple and determine for the young. Um, so if you notice, the emphasis is the way it's saying that you know something uh, is it's based on instruction ie the mind but it, it's also based in your experience and working out in practice so it's coming back to what you were saying before when you were saying that um, you were looking at these Catholic people and and they weren't demonstrating what they were saying um, right. So Proverbs is like saying look if you say you have a knowledge of God then that knowledge is not just purely intellectual, it has to go into your heart and then move into practice. So if we just turn to uh, James chapter 3, uh, James uh, chapter 3, because this comes back to what you've been saying really. Um, <clears throat> James chapter 3 verse 13 to 18, and it, and it dovetails in really nice with what you've been saying. Uh, James chapter 3 verse 13 to 18 he says if you are wise and understand God's ways prove it by living an honorable life doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For whether there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It also peace-loving at all times. It is full of mercy and good deeds, and it shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness and so that that's really coming back to what you were saying really you you were looking for uh, a demonstration in the practical life of, of people who were claiming to be Christian and, and Proverbs is saying what you've been advocating really that you've got to work out in practice and the wisdom uh, is dovetailed here in James about that it works out in practice. Um, so, yeah. So, so just one last thought. Uh, if you read the book of Proverbs, I, I'd encourage you to read it. The thing that came across to me, I've just, read, just been reading it recently. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that wisdom uh, in Proverbs comes down to two two aspects, and you've touched on one of them: humility. Uh, it com wisdom comes down to humility and love that if we if we uh, de self it you know people can try to change themselves by discipline but Proverbs is saying the way you change the way you reorientate your life is de self you where it's not your ego that's the center that your ego kinda takes a back seat and you become more interested in other people and that, that wisdom you see in Christ um, in Philippians 2 it talks about he thought not robbery to be equal with God but made himself no reputation and humbled himself even to the cross so the humility of Jesus is that even though he was God he came down and he humbled himself to the cross and it's that humility that where we're not full of our own ego but that we have a right view of ourselves in relation to God and our fellow man. Uh, that is what uh, Proverbs is working towards. He wants us to work towards de-selfing, de-selfing, de-selfatizing us, where our ego is not becoming the center, but it's more about being humble and, and thinking of other people.
No, I think that's important. I think that um, part of the problem that I run into on the internet in general is that we're so all of us. You know, we we run into this thing of where we we can no one ever wants to admit that they're wrong when they make a mistake or when they're wrong. <coughs> Nobody. And so what it does is that even I've had conversations with people where or arguments with people where, you know. You know, just I'll give you an example where I was right and they were wrong. So I, you know, they said something. I, I presented the evidence as if they were wrong. And they just could not acknowledge it, and then they would argue like they wouldn't even argue that my points were wrong. They just refused to agree. And it's like because somehow they, it seemed like they felt like if they acknowledged that they had made a mistake, that somehow that was saying that they were never going to be right again, which, is, of course, is silly. That's ridiculous. You know, we all make mistakes. We all can be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Yeah. And But no one wants to say that. And, and like, what's happened recently in, in the atheist community, just the last couple of days, people are just going back and forth at each other. And what's happening is, you know, again, you know, you're talking about pride, is that basically... People have they've they've taken pride into whatever group that they're in, you know this this group think, and so that when people who are not in their group say, well, that's wrong, and then they instead of acknowledging it and just saying, okay, that's an error we've made, but uh, you know, it, they they make excuses for it. So what's happening is side A is saying side B did something wrong, you know X Y Z, and then side B is saying side A did the exact same thing, and they did. And each side, rather than saying, okay, well, I'm, the thing that side, the other side did that's wrong, I'm doing that too, and that's also wrong, and they can't do it because they're, they're I, I think ego is a big part of it. And so then I had somebody, this one person say to me that basically if the other guy does something bad, that basically then that, the all bets are off. He can, he can be just as bad as the other guy. And I'm like, well... Then you're the bad guy too. <laughs> if he's bad for doing it, and you do it too, then you're bad for doing it too. <laughs> you know. I, th I think you're right, Joe. I think I think you're spot on. I think a lot of it's the ego, and uh, you know, I include myself in that. I've made mistakes, continue to make mistakes, but like you said, uh, it's about you know, it's about being having that humility to acknowledge that we can be wrong and and. And not having that ego where we feel that we have to be defensive all the time, and right. and and they're not each camp just perfectly how you described it, and it's just ridiculous. But for you know, I want to um, move forward in my own life uh, to be like Christ in that humility where uh, where we put others first, and it's we're not going to trample other people. Uh, it's very difficult on the internet, but. Mm. What what alternative is there? You know, uh, all I know is I'm trying to do it in real life. <laughs> I don't find it easy on the internet. Well, and, and if that's a thing, I mean, the important thing is that we try. I mean, we're, we're always gonna we're gonna fail here and there. But like, one, one here's one thing: something that I've I've done in the past that I'm trying not to do anymore, or at least cut it down, is that when I get into arguments with somebody, sometimes I gotta recognize that. No matter what I say, they're not going to yeah. agree with me. Whether they're right or wrong doesn't really matter. Yeah. And what ends up happening is, that in the past, sometimes I just refuse to let them get the last word, as if somehow, if they got the last word, that would somehow make make them right or they would win. And it was just, and I just realized that it's just silly. It doesn't matter. The rightness or wrongness of either of us isn't isn't. A function of who spoke last. Mm. So if they're just going to get into these arguments and be crazy and yelling, I mean, I at, cer at a certain point, I'm just going to say, "All right, fine, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'll just walk away." You know? And and so, I, like today, even some some of these discussions I've been in, and and I, you know, had these back and forths, and then I see people say more. And what I'm doing is I'm not even looking at it because I'm like, you know what? If I do, I'm going to be I'm going to get into that defensive zone like you were saying, and I'm going to say something, and it's not going to be to any, you know, to, you know nothing good's going to come out of it. It's going to be to my detriment. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get angry. And so rather than do that, they can run on and they can feel whatever they want to feel, and I'm going to just remove myself from it and not 
get caught up to it as, mu as much as I can. You know, I do my, you know, I do my best. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at. It. Okay. Um, any other thoughts, bro? I, uh, I think I've run out um, of things to say on proverbs. I've got, I've got a stack of notes. I'm, I'm giving a Bible study on on Tuesday, so I have a stack of notes. And if you, if you fancy doing a, a study, uh, I've been going through um, uh, some lectures by uh, Professor. Walt K, uh, W A L T K E, of Reformed Theological Seminary, and he's speaking at media.thirdmill.org. Media.thirdmill.org. Type in uh, W A L T K E, and then Proverbs, and there's seven lectures. I'm I'm on the fourth lecture, uh, so I've got stacks of notes, but. Uh, I think we've covered the main issue really, it's about humility and this issue of egotism and this is the essence of wisdom is it's practical and uh, it's not uh, uh, and that's where we're to, to go uh, in the area of humility and love uh, and you know you've touched on some really good points there. I'm going to add, add one thing to something that you said is that you know I think the other um <coughs> You know, it's as far as you know how you have to to live things. The the one thing too is that people very often confuse ideals and values. And you know, the our ideals express the person we want to be, and our values express who we really are, <laughs> who we live up to be. And there's so many times that you know people have these have whatever it is, whether it's you know a religious belief, a secular belief, it doesn't matter. Um, that we say we're for X, Y, and Z, just like I was saying before with the people in church. And but when it come when push comes to shove, what how do we actually behave? You know what do we do? And now, look, we know we, because we're humans and we're frail. And we are faulty that you know we're gonna not always live up to our ideals because sometimes it's hard. It's hard to do that. But there's sometimes we have ideals that we don't really ever intend to live up to, and and those then they're just kind of worthless because you know then it's like that we then then those are things we say because we, again maybe it's ego. We want to we want to present ourselves as as being better than we really are. But but you know our values really are. They don't lie, and they really show what we really what we really are. That's why they're called values, right? Um, one one quick question for you, Jason, because one of the reasons why too uh, I didn't want to I didn't want to suggest a topic because you know because there are so many different um, denominations of Christian, and, and and not really knowing what your position is, I I didn't want to pick a topic that wouldn't be relevant because I don't want to assume your position for you because I don't think that's ever ever fair to do to somebody. Um, so I want to ask you a question. So this way, just for future knowledge, and this will this may affect you know what I suggest as topics for us to discuss. But are you, are you when I are you a Bible literalist? As in, like everything in Genesis, everything in the entire Bible is totally literal. Or some things are literal, and some things are interpreted. Some things are parable, and some things are are uh, metaphor. Um, I won't like to uh, be pulled in a straitjacket there like that, Joel. Uh, okay. You can believe the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, I, I believe in the historical grammatical method. So whatever. A passage is historical. I believe it's historical. Wherever it's a parable, I believe it's a parable. So okay, I, I, that, I, that, that that answers my question very well. Thank you. Because I, I was just, wasn't sure. Because again, I've dealt with I've you know communicated with different people, and and different people will have a different answer to that question. So that that very much I, covers what you know, answered my question. So that's good. And actually, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that. That was definitely more in the vein that I was when I was a believer. So. Um, and that actually gets rid of a bunch of stuff, <laughs> so that's that's cool. Um, you, you I, I didn't want I didn't want to assume your position for you because that would would never would never be fair. 
If you want to understand my, my position, the uh, Francis Schaeffer, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, and Princeton School of Theology, the early, the early years of Princeton Seminary, the scholars there like Gresham Machen, B.B. Warfield, Charles Hodge, uh, and then British Evangelical Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, and the American Evangelical Francis Schaeffer. So if you study Francis Schaeffer and Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, you pretty much get a handle. Of where I'm at theologically, okay. which no atheist yet has done. <laughs> but if they studied, if they actually studied Francis Schaeffer and studied Lloyd Jones, you'd be able to get inside and ask me questions and open me up concerning what I believe. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so that's Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, you can go uh, on Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones Recording Trust. You can look at, if you go on the Banner of Truth. Uh, website. There'll be articles about Lloyd Jones. I've also given a lecture on the last report to Martin Lloyd Jones. Uh, Francis Schaefer, if you go to La Brief Fellowship, you can listen to his lectures there. I've listened to most of his lectures. So just type, uh, sorry, I turned you off. I, just, I was typing those into Skype just to make sure that I've got the names correctly. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, that's it. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, those are the two guys that have had the biggest influence on me, theologically and uh, apologetically. So if you if you if you get a grip with them and you start asking me questions because you've studied them, then you you'll be hitting you'll be hitting me uh, in the right direction on my questions. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jason. But no no atheist has ever taken the time to do that. So you're the first atheist that's tried wants to actually find out my position and, and engage where I'm actually at on that. So I really appreciate that. Well, you're quite welcome. Um, what about you, bro? Is there is if I if I had to understand your position, what what is there anybody I could look at or is there anything any idea that that are central to where you're at? Hmm. That's a tough that's a tough one. Um, because I, I'm very I'm very eclectic. I, I don't really fall into any any specific school of thought because I find you know many of them have things of value, but there's always something that I find that doesn't sit right with me or or has gaps, and so I kind of it makes it very difficult sometimes to because like I said that well you know I'm, I'm not on I'm not on any team you know <laughs> so. Um, it's good, it's good Joe. I, I, even though I, I've mentioned these two guys, I, I like I like a variety, eclectic mix of different thinkers and, and stuff. So it's good. It's good what you're saying. Well, exactly, and, and that's, that's the thing too. Yeah, because there's nobody, you know, there's you know, for all all us humans, you know, none of us gets it all right. None of us is perfect. So. You know, it's good to to learn from people, and, and even people we disagree with, we can learn from. Um, but you know, I think what the problem is that when people start getting too much into a, well, I'm a this in this camp or that camp again, like we said before, you know, that's when they when they start getting more defensive, and then it becomes about making their that you know that school of thought or that camp win or be right, and not so much about what's actually true or right or correct or or moral or decent or whatever. Joe. Jo yeah. Guy, there's an called uh, John McDrockwell. He's really nice. Would you mind if I just send him a link? I'm sorry, say again? Would you mind if I sent a link to John F. McDrockwell? He's an atheist and he's a really nice guy and I think you'd like like him. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, because uh, I, I can basically stay until dinner starts, so... <laughs> John, if you want to come on, mate. Uh, I've sent you a link, John, if you want to come on, bro. <coughs> <coughs> well, I'll I tell you what, uh, Joe, you know, I really appreciate the conversation that we've had. And yeah, I just thought that, you know, this is what we should be doing. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought this was good too, and, and I'm definitely willing to do this again. 
Uh, is there any topic that you'd like to do next time? If you ever, if you ever uh, wanted to do one, is there anything that you fancy doing? Okay, I guess what I'll do is maybe next time we'll talk in you know in, in more broad terms again because I don't want to get into a debate or anything. I like, I like having a discussion like this. You know, I guess we'll talk. I'd like to talk about you know your view of of science and the scientific community. Okay, is that you is that a good one? Yeah, yeah. Just let me know what day or whatever. Okay. Good deal. <coughs> All right, mate. Appreciate that. Well, thanks for having me on, Jason. And uh, you know, you be well. I hope hope your cold doesn't last for too long. And so, what are you having for dinner? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What are you having for dinner? We're having chicken with uh, garlic. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, my wife's a good cook, so I'm <coughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Do, do you, do you um, hello, John. Oh, hi, John. Have oh, you, good day, guys. How's it going? Hi, How you doing, mate? You okay? I'm doing well, Jay. Just uh, just give me a few minutes here. I'm trying to get my computer in order. I'll uh, I'll be with you guys in a second. Have you have you ever met Joe? Uh, I believe I've uh, I've heard of uh, Joe. He's serious mind, right? That's right. Yeah, totally. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a subscriber to the Breakfast Club, so I see you every, every couple days or so. Um, cool. Good, good. You like, cool. you like John, Joe. You know, he's your kind of guy. <laughs> cool. Good cool, guy. cool, guys. So I was, I mean, uh, I noticed the, the title of the Hangout is uh, about Proverbs 8, which is one of my, one of my favorite uh, Proverbs, actually. Um, and I was curious, did you guys cover it already, or have you been looking into it, or? Well, we we just we just uh, covered a little bit. We just talked about wisdom, what it was. We looked at James three thirteen to eighteen about wisdom is about practical living, and uh, Joel just shared about his journey from Catholicism to atheism and how he was uh, he he felt like the Catholics were uh, Christians were uh, people who named the name of Jesus weren't uh, living practically. Um, so he kind of came back to that while we were looking at Proverbs. Oh, awesome. <coughs> well, it's really, it's really great to hear your voice today. Um, I'm, uh, I, that's, a, that's a terrible cough you have, though. Yeah, I know. Sorry, guys. No problem. <coughs> Please forgive me. So uh, have you got any thoughts, bro? Have you read it or anything? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, this this uh, particular proverb is is really amazing in its um in its depiction of wisdom as as a anthropomorphic uh, being that's talking to us, right? And I think there's there's a lot to um that's probably background in the in the culture about you know um that maybe the source of wisdom is a, a being out there, um but I think it's you know it's it's very interesting to hear what they thought that wisdom would say to them. You know, I think that's it's it's a really interesting uh, analysis of what they view as wisdom at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll throw a spanner in the works. <coughs> if you go to Proverbs chapter seven, it says, "Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instruction as you guard your own eyes." Tie them on your fingers, a reminder, write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister, make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from the affair with an immoral woman, from listening to the flattery of promiscuous women. While I was at the widow of, window of my house, looking through the curtain, I saw some native young men, and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman strolling down the path by her house. It was a twilight in the evening, a deep darkness fell. The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart, and she was brash, rebellious type, and never content to stay at home. She is often in the streets and markets, soliciting at every corner. So it goes down there, and it's basically showing that this guy gets seduced by this woman, verse 21. So she seduced him, and her pretty speech, and enticed him with her flattery. Now here's the issue, that this kind of you know, the art of good teaching is repeating something again, but in a different so there's this repetitiveness within the Proverbs where there are certain themes that are repeated time and time again. One of them is, is the issue of adultery. And it starts at, at the beginning of, of Proverbs and then it comes here to chapter seven. And then it says, Listen 
as wisdom calls out in verse chapter 8. And whenever you hear wisdom calls out, it's like saying, uh -uh, uh -uh, alarm bells, alarm bells, there's danger, there's danger. Uh, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... I mean, it's very interesting the way that this proverb set up, and I didn't really notice it before, but it does kind of take that, um, it, it sort of makes a parallel almost between the immoral woman and the woman of wisdom, right? It's very strange, because in some of the descriptions, you're right, I mean, it does repeat um, certain certain things about standing in the doorway and, and calling out to people, um, trying to convince others of her rightness or, or you know that that she can provide happiness and I think he's he's trying to show that it, it's it's sort of um, they're almost two sides of the same sort of temptation that there's that there's um, there's the temptation of wisdom and the temptation of immorality in that in that way um, and I you know I, I don't know I it's I think it's interesting that they're both uh, female um, I guess I guess that was a pretty common thing but I think it's you know that they're both uh, Portrayed as female characters rather than than male. Yeah, the the if you're not like you've not it's really good, John. I'm impressed with you, bro. Because um, the the idea of wisdom uh, in chapter eight is feminine, like you said. The Hebrew for wisdom in this chapter is has a fe has a feminine nuance to it. So, you know, it's really good that you spotted that. That's really good. Oh. So, sorry to interrupt, Jason. I, I got to drop now, but uh, thanks again for having me in. And, and John, nice to meet you. I hope, hope to run into you again. Absolutely, John. Thank you, mate. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time, bro. Take care. <coughs> um, yeah, so well spotted there. Um, I, I found um, it was interesting uh, the question about. <coughs> I was listening to a professor who was lecturing on it, and one of the students asked, Well, why is it the sun? And. Uh, if you look at if you if you actually read the proverbs, there is the underlying um, implicit uh, implicit uh, uh, not implicit. Um, the the there's a, quite a few verses where the mother is also the instructor as well as the father. So there is the implication that the daughters are being taught. The reason why it's saying son is because they were seen as the head of the household with the with the father. Then when you, it starts at the beginning with the son, yet at the end in chapter 31, it ends with the wife uh, and what a good wife is. And then what I found, what what I find, and it was really good what you said about this contrast between wisdom and the adulteress, the the adulterer, is the the <coughs> the adulterer, uh, the man and the woman, they're loitering, um, they're disloyal. And yet the woman in um, 31, uh, the wife, uh, the good wife, is loyal. Uh, she's not loitering. She's busy. Uh, and so does that. Con I think she's a contrast of what wisdom is personified in in 31. So, so I I, I found it really enriching reading it because. Um, it, 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 the first first chapter one to to chapter ten, chapter nine is kind of if you imagine <coughs> a sniper gun and it's firing a bullet at a time and the bullet is it's firing one bullet at a time it's like one bullet adultery, another one is watch your money, and another bullet is adultery and then another bullet is watch your money. So first chapter one to chapter ten, uh, chapter nine is couple of themes and it's just focusing on them but when it gets to chapter 10 it's like a shotgun where it just shoots out all these pellets and you get all these different themes there's loads of themes it's not just about money and sex it's also it's, it's about humility it's about marriage and uh, it's about work and all sorts of things like that a variety of themes but when you pull them all together when you bring bring all these themes together it seems to be that it comes down to these two issues of humility and love and you know uh, and I brought that back with Joe is that you know that the whole point of Christ is the humility that he showed um, and the love that he showed and that is what a Christian should be when they're born with the Holy Spirit they should have that and a professor um, of Reformed Theological Seminary which I'll give a link under the video made a great a really good point and he said that people try to change themselves by discipline they, they give themselves a regime or an order 
and he said, or a structure to try and change. And he said, but it's more deeper than that. If we're going to change our, our moral, our, our moral compass, it it's about de-selfing uh, us, de-selfing ourselves, where our ego becomes less of an ego, and we over the process we de we we de-self our ego and become more humble and more um, thinking of others and that is the way to change by concentrating on the inner ego and, and, and deflating it as it were and focusing on you know being lonely and, and, and caring that's what I'm working towards yeah I mean I think that's I think that's right I think um, w within Proverbs there's a lot of the idea that that conceit and and the conceited man is is equated with the foolish man a lot, and I think that's I think that's a very um, that's really that's really uh, accurate uh, way of describing those that first you know summing up those first uh, ten or nine chapters of. <laughs> and I mean you're right. I mean I think um, by the time you get to to ten, it definitely does switch uh, almost focus. Um, it becomes just a list of aphorisms, and and you yeah, I mean you start to see that it's. It's very much almost just a, a like a compilation of sayings rather than than a story about um, a particular topic. And I, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, so you know, I I love um, one of the one of my favorite verses in there, um, especially in, in eight is uh, let me see here one two uh, eight uh, seventeen, um, and it's it's wisdom talking, and she says, uh, "I love those who love me, and whoever looks for me can find me." You know, and I love, I love, I really like that, uh, that very idea. You know, that it's, um, it's wisdom is very much an attitude rather than, than something to be attained. Um, yeah. And that it's more about you know the attitude towards wisdom rather than, than any sort of uh, goal that you actually uh, get to. Yeah, I think I think Book of Proverbs and here because uh, it's also about wi get it, get wisdom more than gold and stuff like that. It's more precious than rubies. For for the for the book of Proverbs, it's it's about your your ethics is a way of life. It's a way of life. It's a way. You know, you take all these. Um, you've got to take. You get you run into problems if you just take one. Um, say one proverb, say in chapter ten or twelve or wherever. You just take one proverb. You you try and understand it. You you miss the impact. You've got to take them all together. And it, what it's saying is there's a, there's a certain way of life that if you live that kind of way of life, um, you know, then you're going to be blessed. And if you don't live that life, then you're not going to be blessed. And and so so I think you're right in what you spotted there about about that. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just, I mean, I really, I, Proverbs is one of the, I think it's one of the better books of the Bible, um, and it's, and it's really, it's, it's a lot to do with its, its very um, selfless ide ideals, and, and this idea that we can, that, you know, that, that we can make the distinction between a, a good man and a, and a bad man by just simply assessing their actions, right, and I think there's, there's a lot to that, it's very, it's very much about the pragmatics of actual living, in, in a theological context rather than than simply the theological context and then trying to apply it to living, right? I think it's, um, in that way, it sort of steps out of the usual um, mode of the bio of biblical literature. Yeah. Um, Proverbs is, is unique in, in that sense. Um, <clears throat> I think that, I think a couple, one or two things is that ethics here is, you know, it's on about uh, having a passion for wisdom, well, wisdom in the Bible is symbolic of the Word of Jesus, um, and <coughs> as you get as you get rooted and grounded in 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 what God is saying in the Word, and you imbibe it and allow it to live in you, and it becomes a way of life where your self, that your ego is deflated, and it becomes less of you and more of God and more of other people. Uh, uh, that is the way of life to live, and if you compare that to um, you know the history of Western ethics, you know like from the Enlightenment, um, there is a difference. There's a different emphasis uh, because 
the the knowledge here is not just purely intellectual. It's, it's partly that because it says search for wisdom and, and understand wisdom. But it's also experiential that you know it in your experience but then it works out in practice. And I think that um, you know, post in, uh, since the Enlightenment, uh, you might disagree. I've mentioned this before to Joel. Uh, there was an emphasis on knowledge is objective and that we are rational. We have this objective knowledge, um, and we can we can get that knowledge and apply it. Whereas this is saying no, it's not just getting this objective knowledge. It's deeper than that. We're, when we're knowing something, it, it, uh, it, it goes deeper. We, there is an experience, and then there is a practice. Uh, I know that pragmatism might could could be said to to maybe be a bit similar, or or even existentialism. But existentialism doesn't have the same kind of foundation as proverbs, and pragmatism, uh, I don't think, has the same kind of foundation as proverbs. Because with proverbs, there are principles first. Uh, whereas pragmatism, it's not necessarily principle based, it's mainly based on whether it actually works, whereas Proverbs is, there's the principle, uh, here's the principle, and it will work. Um, so what I'm saying is, there's a guy called Michael Polanyi, uh, who's a philosopher of science, who wrote, wrote uh, a book on, on uh, philosophy of science, uh, actually, and basically he's saying that in scientific knowledge it's not just objectivity that we're actually committed ourselves we actually commit ourselves by faith when we're actually uh, having a hypothesis and investigating whether it's correct or not there's a commitment a faith commitment uh, so what I'm saying is Proverbs uh, kinda dovetails into what Michael Polan is saying and, and kinda is I think a bit more deeper than the enlightenment project of what it was saying knowledge was all about leave it to you yeah I mean I, I don't know I, I think um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I see that same connection but I think I you know I take your I take your um, your point that it's uh, you know that there's there's certain parts of our understanding that were I mean very that that seem a lot less explained now after the Enlightenment rather than before right I think that's that's totally something that I can that I can definitely see um, when, I mean, when we're talking about you know subject and objectivity and things like that, I think you know we we owe a lot to Descartes in that sense about you know the, the distinction between subject and object, and yeah. I think you know at, from that point of view, yes, I mean I think we endeavored to become more objective in our understanding, and maybe you know I think I think many people thought they got there, um, but you know I think I think we know. Now that you know, it's 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 a little more complex uh, in in removing yourself from that in that distinction um, and trying to see the objective fact. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work it into proverbs here and see how it could how it could kind of connect. I think, you know, I guess I guess I, the way I yeah, I mean the way I see wisdom, I mean it 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 says something about like um you know uh, every what is it everything. Everything I say is true, and nothing is false or misleading. Uh, to the man with insight, all is clear, and to the well-informed, all is plain. Right? Um, I think it's 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 along those lines, right? Where I think that, you know, that they understood the distinction between um, where, you know, where the facts of the matter came from. That that we were endeavoring to see it all and to see as much as we could, but that. I think I think they also had that same sense that that we kind of come to that um, at base there may be some sort of intentional um, action at the base of our understanding that seems to be unexplained or at least hidden from our from our understanding, right? And I think that they were picking up on that sort of that sort of transcendental idea that they couldn't quite put their finger on. Um, well, I, I I understand where you're coming from. Those who are listening, I'm in conversation with John McDropout. He's an atheist, and we've had Joe's an atheist, so I'm the Christian, and John's the atheist. Just so people understand what's happening. I I understand where you're coming from. You, that that would be your perspective as an atheist. I would say, you know, if you go if you go uh, if you go back to Proverbs chapter one, um, and um, 
you know, verse seven is the key is the key verse really. Uh, Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, John, and this thing uh, comes through the through right through like a golden thread through Proverbs. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So I hear what you're saying, and that would be uh, <coughs> from a, a perspective of a, of, of a non-believer uh, looking at uh, religions of ancient Near East, that would be a valid perspective to take. But from, from my perspective, uh, who believes that the Bible was the word of God um, that and, and even if you didn't you, you'd have to admit that in Proverbs 1 verse 7 they understand he, the, the writer sees the the foundation of what he's saying is is rooted in this fear this fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge so when you know the <clears throat> the, the professor who I'll link to uh, is, a, is a good lecturer uh, said this that the the writer of Proverbs um, is not just writing uh, pithy sayings. God stands behind the proverbs, and that's the key here. So, so like, that's a completely different perspective from what you're saying. How you perceive the writer of of this of whatever you see, whoever you think wrote this book or whatever, you know. Yeah, I I think I see what you're saying. Um, you know, I, I do. You know, it. I think I think you're right. I mean, I think that theme is. Throughout the the proverbs, where you know the especially that 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 verse uh, one verse seven, um, you know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I think my my version here says um, to have knowledge you must have first have reverence. You must first have reverence for the Lord, um, and then it goes on to say stupid people have no respect for wisdom and refuse to learn. And um, I think I think you're right. I think they they saw wisdom as having to have that that. Um, Ontological basis that going from um, a, a, a source of the knowledge, right? Somebody who had the knowledge and could correct any um, in, incorrectness or any errors in in what they thought they knew. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm, I maybe don't see it definitely as as them saying that um, that somehow um, uh, a god. And the the actions that might be recalled, the, the worshiping of that god, or the or the the you know the the, the sort of uh, traditions that might go along with that, are the basis of the knowledge. I think they're talking more about this, um, like I said, more of a more of a transcendental basis for for the action, for the intention of intelligibility, right? And I think um, you know it's it's it may be it may be reading a little more deep into into it than they might even be seeing it, but I think that. I think there's um, there's something sort of mystical about about the idea that this reverence for the Lord has to be in place first before you can have knowledge. Um, and I, I think oftentimes when it uses it, it it seems to switch off of that topic right away when it when it uses the reverence of the Lord, like that the that the fear of the Lord and that we must respect the Lord. And then it'll say something about the action of wisdom right afterwards, like um, to have no respect for wisdom and to refuse to learn is what stupid people do, is, is what they'll say. Um, and so they'll they'll be talking a lot about, you know, that, you know, and so I, in a lot of ways I almost feel like they're saying that the pursuit of wisdom is the reverence for the Lord, that almost, that, that trying to get to that basis and trying to get down to that, um, to that transcendental intelligibility is the reverence for the Lord in in a way, but maybe I'm maybe I'm just uh, putting something on top of it that's not there. So, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm just getting uh, Bible translation. Um, <coughs> if you just go to Proverbs chapter one again, I'm reading for the King James. Uh, it says, "The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction." to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. I think, I think you would have a good argument, except for one thing, is that if you read the whole book of Proverbs, 
and it, it dovetails into the last chapter in chapter 31 where it has the the good wife and it talks about what a good wife is uh, you know she keeps the hall and etc and what you find throughout the book is this issue about loyalty and about integrity and I think that dovetails into their concept of God which is a covenant keeping God <clears throat> so as they see, as from my perspective as they see their God as a covenant keeping God they see that they have to reflect that in their own relationships so I would say it's the other way around I would say that their theology is coming from their own God rather than what you're saying is they're doing their theology reaching to God I would say it would be the other way around and the, the reason why I would say that is because this issue of covenant this issue of loyalty and if you did a study of all the proverbs most of them if all dovetail to this issue of of loyalty and, and uh, covenant keeping which is is reflective of uh, Solomon's and, and David's God and that's where the issue of the fear of the Lord comes from is it's it's a respect for this covenant keeping God hmm. those, those yeah I mean I, I, I think I see I think I see what you're saying I don't know I mean I, I don't know if I would use the word loyalty to describe it it may be um, well, you're, uh, you're, an, an intention towards knowledge like um, a, a, almost like a, a motivation like we were like I was saying um, and I think maybe maybe I'm just maybe we're just quibbling over what word we're using to describe it. I think it's very important because you're saying no. I think it's really important because <coughs> you're saying, from what I understand, you're saying that that their mystical kind of experiences are a kind and and the way they are doing the the ref, the reflection of ethics and theology is they're reaching in that transcendentness to something. Uh, so that's presuming. That there is no God, and I'm not saying I'm not saying in this context. Um, I'm just imagining that I'm 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 an atheist like you. It's, you know that they're sort of reaching towards God through their some kind of mystical experience to reach the transcendent, and the way they do it is by their practical uh, understanding of of how they're doing it, their various proverbs. I understand that, and I, uh, uh, but I would say I come back to this issue of <coughs> that if you if you did a if you went through every chapter and you looked at the issue, the issue is this issue of loyalty. It's an issue of uh, faithfulness and experience of God <coughs> from a Hebrew perspective, whether it be Proverbs or any of the books in the Old Testament, comes down to that God is faithful, that He's a covenant-keeping God. And that um, we are to mimic that in our relationships, because I know scholars will say, "Well, there's nothing much about Israel mentioned there," <coughs> but I would say that it's implicit. The covenant-keeping God is implicit within the text, and it, it's reflected in the in the uh, the proverbs that are given collectively as covenant-keeping. That that would be my argument to what you're saying. So, in other words, it's not mystical ex experience first, uh, rooted in trying to make proverbs. Uh, I would say that it's rooted in this issue of relationship, covenant relationship, between human beings and between God, and then you have the mystical experience, and the experience your ex your experience um, has to work out. In, in the faithfulness of, of your daily relationship with God and your fellow man. Well, I definitely, I mean, I definitely see this this idea of, of covenant keeping and and this um, there, I mean, Proverbs Proverbs especially uh, <coughs> makes a lot of statements about um, uh, the you know the responsibilities of the wise man and and the and the response that one can expect from the Lord. Um, in 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 response to these actions, and I think um, I think you're right. There is there is something about um, setting down the relationship between the the wise man and God, um, and I think that's I think that's absolutely accurate. Uh, Thanks. But I you know I think I think when I'm talking about you know this this reaching to the transcendence, I I I think I'm maybe I just didn't explain it um, 
in the, in the right order? Because it sounded like maybe you were reversing what I was trying to get at, where I'm saying that the, they, these guys are, are, are pondering. Whoever wrote this book is, is pondering knowledge and wisdom and, and where we get that. And I think that you know any sort of um, internal uh, thought process like that, where we start to critique our own thoughts, um, I think... I think there are walls that we hit in, in those thought processes about c trying to confirm with certainty um, certain aspects of our knowledge. And I think, I think the, the feeling for, for those people was that the, the certainty that they felt and the certainty that they understood um, had to stem from somewhere. It had to be rooted in this, in this thing that they, had, that they have, um, this, this knowledge or this certainty about their about their actions and their interactions and their relationship as far as their place in the universe with the God. And I think that that's, that's sort of what I'm getting at, is that they're, they're maybe creating a, more of a metaphysical framework under which their knowledge can be certain. And I think that's sort of what I'm getting at. And, and whether or not I think I, um, I'm seeing a God in that picture, I think I, think I do in fact see that they are they're placing the transcendence um, and, and the framework of transcendence over top of their pursuit of the knowledge. I think that's I think that's what I'm getting at. I think that um, if you read Proverbs, it's about a way of life. You know, you take all these proverbs, uh, and it's a way of life. So the writer is is giving you a way of life, and that way of life is in relation to God, and as it's in relation to God, it, it means a relationship to, to fellow human beings. Um, um, and the question really is, is that valid for today or not? You know, um, from an atheist perspective, you know, is this a valid, is, is this valid to you? Is, 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 is what this proverb, the, the proverb say, saying, the the proverb the writer of proverbs saying is it is it is it valid to you or not uh, for me it's valid <coughs> because when I sum all these up <coughs> when I sum all these proverbs up it comes down to humility and love and that as I put God at the center sorry about this John <coughs> it's getting late and it's getting no and it's no problem dear. It's kicking off. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. As I, as as God becomes more central and the ego becomes less, and you deflate yourself, where by the Holy Spirit He takes over more of you, and you live that life of humility and love. <coughs> if that's a valid, if that's a lifestyle that can be, then I would want that lifestyle, and. Uh, so the question is, is it valid? I think, you know, what's the point? I mean, I, I like to study Aristotle and Plato, and we can learn from all these various cultures and various religions. We can learn from all these things, and I, I, I really enjoy talking to you, John. <laughs> well, I enjoy talking to you too, Jay, and I mean, I think... You know, I think I think one of the here one of the my favorite verses in here actually uh, covers kind of what my attitude towards wisdom is, and I think it's really really great. It's um, it's uh, it's uh, chapter Proverbs chapter nine verse seven, um, verse seven and uh, all the way up to verse nine. Um, and it's if you correct a conceited man, you will only be insulted, and if you reprimand an evil man, you will only get hurt. Never correct a conceited man; he will hate you for it. But if you correct a wise man, he will respect you. Anything you say to a wise man will make him wiser, and whatever you tell a righteous man will add to his knowledge. And I think, you know, I think that's that's kind of how I look at it, right? I mean, I don't think, I think they were very, I think the person who wrote this book was very open to knowledge and felt that, you know, he could he could discuss things with other people in a very open and honest way. Um, and I think he he saw that as as part of wisdom and being able to do that in a in a very constructive way and to take. To take criticism constructively um, is is one of the most important things, right? Yeah, that's one of my favorite verses as well, John. I, I really like that myself. Definitely, yeah. So I Maybe mean, you I, go back to China. No, Sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. <coughs> if you go to nine, verse ten, the fear of the Lord again, it comes up again. The fear of the Lord 
is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. And then it goes on. Wisdom will multiply your days, add years to your life. So it's, it's going to be beneficial. Verse 13, the woman named Folly is brass. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. So the, the book of Proverbs is offering, it's saying, you know, there's a way to live. If you live that life, you know, you're going to be blessed. If you don't live that life, if, if, there are dangers. There's adultery. There's drink. There's all sorts of these temptations. Um, if you go down those uh, experiences, they're, they're not going to be a blessing to you. So, you know, for me, um, you know, I, <coughs> I find that Proverbs is relevant today um, in that. And I think that... Um, you know, it's enriched me in my relationship with God. I, I really have grown the last couple of days because I'm doing a Bible study on Tuesday for the church that I'm at. And I've really grown, John. I've really been challenged to be less egotistical and to really uh, try and live in more humility like Christ uh, was. Um, and, I, you know, I just... It's really good that you, uh, I'm really impressed with your knowledge of Proverbs, <clears throat> but I, I just wish you would come to know the Lord and put your faith in Him, bro, and, and trust in Him and, and find Him as your Lord and Savior because, you know, He, he died for you and he, he gave His life for you, and, he, and that's the best place to be because without, without that, <clears throat> where are the boundaries? It has boundaries. It has, it ha it's saying, here's the boundary, and if you live within the boundary, then you're blessed. So without that, without God giving you a boundary, where are the boundaries, John? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I, I, um, you know, I really appreciate that you, you know, you do, you are. Um, did you notice that I, I take um, Proverbs very seriously, or or a lot of the Bible very seriously? Where, you know, I, I really want to get to the message of it. You know, I really want to feel. I want to. I want to learn the lesson and at least assess it for myself, right? And um, you know, along those lines, you know, I really, I, 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 actually really appreciate when people tell me that, you know, that they want me to, um, to become a Christian, or they want me to find Jesus as my Savior. I think, I think I feel, I feel the care that that statement carries, and I think, I think there's a lot of love that that's wrapped up in that statement. And I know, I know that, um, I know that that's the case with you, Jay. So I mean, I don't, I think, uh, you know, I, I take that very seriously, also. Um, you know, as as far as, um, you know, I. Whether or not I can, um, you know, I can take uh, all of theology very seriously and still um, maintain a distance from uh, the Christian belief, um, I think I think I can do that. But you know, I think you're right that um, there there may be attitude. You know, I think I think they, you know, even even Proverbs very much uh, states it out that you know I think it's very much about the attitude and about the motivations that we that we have. And um, you know, I'm uh, you know I think I. I feel like mine are pure. Uh, my motivations, my intentions are pure. But I, you know, it's uh, it, there's always that that question about being able to see yourself uh, accurately. Um, so I don't I don't know if that makes any sense, Jay. Like I, but I do I do appreciate the the thoughts and the the um, you know the sentiment of. of, of <coughs> John, I love you, mate. I love you too, Jay. And um, I'm very impressed that you have studied proverbs. You're the only atheist that I've ever met. That has actually shown any competence uh, in actually understanding the Bible, and I've talked to hundreds of atheists over the last six years. So you're the only one who actually talking about the book and actually knows what they're talking about. So sure. well, I mean, I, I come by it honestly, right? I mean, I was I was raised as a Pentecostal, and I went to a private Christian school from my growing up. So I mean, Bible class um, tended to inhabit a lot of the other classes that I took in school. Um, and we did we did actually you know do a lot of Bible reading and you know when I when I was a Christian I I, I absolutely believed this book was the inspired word of God and I was hungry for every piece of wisdom that I could glean out of it and I think Proverbs was one of the like you know the very first places I started doing that and you know you kind of work your way out from there and there is a lot you can glean but Proverbs is one of the places where you know just the after you know, after chapter 10 when you get into the list of aphorisms and and the sayings and I think you you get a real sense of that this is in fact an attempt to 
compile the knowledge of a culture and, and compile the knowledge of that day um, in, in a way that, that people could, could learn from and, and take to heart, right? Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that, that's not never a wasted effort when we, when we attempt to learn what other people find important. Uh, I don't know if it's true, I've not checked it out, but the professor was lecturing um, and uh, he, he said that the difference between, because in ancient Near East there are other cultures with uh, proverbs, and he was saying that uh, the difference between the book of Proverbs and other proverbs of ancient cultures is that they were often addressed to kings and princes and the top dogs of society, where democratizes the proverbs. It's, it's not just for an elite group, it's for everybody, uh, which I thought was an interesting um, observation. Uh, John, <coughs> I, have you, could you do us a favor? Could you go on Acts 17 Apologetics? Acts 17 Apologetics, I can try. On YouTube. And there is, a, if you go down to about eight or nine videos, there's an interview between a guy, um, David Wood, and a French atheist. And I just wondered if you could play it on your YouTube thing, and, and then I, I put you on as the main thing. Sure. Uh, and uh, what is it with? Let's see here. It, it's Apologetics, Acts 17 Apologetics. Okay, I'm on the Acts Apologetics site here. Um, let's see. And uh, if you go on. Um, if, as, you, as you go on the main page, um, you keep looking down to about eight or nine videos. You'll see a video, I think it's Guillain or Guillain or some, some white French atheist anyway. It says French atheist converted. <coughs> How a French atheist becomes a Christian? Yeah, could you put that on and then on your your thing and I'll put you on the main thing and then could we just listen to it and then you give me a reaction what you think? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, just scroll it to the front here and I'll put myself on screen share. Okay, I hope my uh, computer doesn't break down on here. I'll make sure my sound's working. Thanks, John. So, can we listen to no this and, and then you deconstruct it, what you think? Sure, that sounds fun. They won't mind. They'll, they'll let you use their videos. They'll let me use the videos, so they're okay. Yo, we just got back from a conference. Uh, I watched two of your papers. What were those about? Well, they were about philosophical theology and on the issues surrounding God's providential control of human free choices. So, discussing the relationship between determinism, free will, and moral responsibility. And. <coughs> As you can imagine, I was clenching the sides of my seat uh, uh, when, when, when I was uh, listening to this. Uh, Guillaume. After listening to your papers, it's clear that you have a lot to say on a lot of issues. You You were, on a, you, were on a, you were in a series of presentations along with uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, Sorry about this, Jay. Sorry, man. So, you probably have a lot to say, but a lot, a lot of people are just going to be interested for now in how you became a Christian, because you were a French atheist. I guess you're, you're still French, yes, in, in a sense. Yes, I am. That hasn't changed. Now, based on YouTube comments, anyone who believes in Christianity is really, really dumb. So you must 
uh, just believe what you're told to believe. You weren't very educated. Someone came along, told your message. You couldn't think for yourself, and that's how you became a Christian. Is that is that about right? It's not quite the story. There are some differences here and there, but uh, well, it just, just what was your what was your educational background before you know as you were growing up? Yeah. So what I it was clear from some of the earlier stages that I was much more scientifically inclined rather than literary or economic. So I went on to study um, math, physics, and engineering in college. I did some program in France that's called a uh, prep school. It's Matsup Matspe. It's a very high pressure two year preparation for the various prestigious engineering school called it's called Class Preparatoire aux Grandes Écoles. And basically, it's two years of intense math physics to um, prepare you for a contest to enter into those prestigious schools. So I did that. I graduated <laughs> in computer science, and I landed a job in computer science as a software developer in finance. And apart from education, what, what 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 was going on during this time? Well, I, at that time, I was still, still an atheist, and I was essentially trying to pursue my own happiness on all fronts. So I was pursuing this to obtain at least a stable position and a job. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, also playing at the time in a rock band. I was playing keyboard in a rock band, and we were starting to French rock band. various concerts. We were singing in English, but we were French, and uh, the. The band was a lot of fun, and I enjoyed playing with these guys. And uh, on the sports front, I also discovered that I could jump three feet high. And so, since I'm six feet four, they put me in a volleyball team, and I ended up playing in national league. And and I I've seen I've seen the footage of you spiking. There's that shot of you coming up. Oh, and here's the net. Here's you rising above it, and everyone's way down there, and you just slamming it right over yeah, everyone. Those were good times. Yeah, good time, good season. time. And so I was my own happiness on all those fronts. There was the music, the sports, and the, the job. And on the front of the women conquest, at least uh, in France, uh, for a young atheist my age, one of the ideals was also to multiply feminine conquests. And I was starting to have enough success there to satisfy the raunchy standards of the volleyball locker room. So my life was doing pretty well on all those fronts, and I was trying to be happy and doing a good job at it. So it sounds like you're sort of living the, the secular atheist dream, right? You're you're I wasn't complaining. You're uh, you're you're in sports. You're playing music, getting lots of girls. Something obviously happened to change your mind about things. So yeah. what, what's going on? Well, it was an unusual set of circumstances. I went on vacation with my older brother to the Caribbean in the island of Saint Martin. Is he um, tall like you? Yes, he is. Yeah. And he plays also volleyball. So yeah. we went there together, essentially trying to. Have a good time with tropical weather, white sand, uh, turquoise blue water, and the occasional beach volleyball game. So, what's not to like? And given the ungodly amount of vacation that we have in France, we went there for three and a half weeks. <laughs> and during our stay over there, we one day went to a little bit of a distant beach. Um, and coming back from the beach, uh, for some reason, that day we decided to come back hitchhiking. I had never hitchhiked in my entire life until that day, and I have never done it ever since. But for some reason, it was decided we would hitchhike our way home. So we start hitchhiking, and uh, a few minutes after, there's a car that stops. In there, there was two tourists, two women from the United States. One, from, one was from Miami, the other one was from New York. And they were actually not stopping to pick us up. They were stopping to ask for directions. And they were lost on their way from the airport to their hotel. As it turns out, the hotel or the airport were nowhere near the beach at which <coughs> they were clearly way lost. And here they were asking for directions. Now, they told us where they were going, and it turns out that their hotel was right next door to the house at which we were staying. So we told them, well, look, we're happy to tell you. Just pick us up and we'll go there. So we get in, and uh, they were attractive enough that I started flirting, and we were trying to see them again on the, on the island before we left. And it turned out that we did, and I ended up dating the one who was in New York. And the, I quickly found out, though, that uh, she was a professing Christian. She said that she believed in God, which, in my own worldview at that time, was pretty, pretty much an intellectual suicide. And also attached to that problematic belief was her belief that sex only belonged in marriage, which is even crazier than theism, if that was ever possible. So here we are now in this, this long-distance relationship, because I flew back to Paris, she flew back to New York, and here we were, and I, I essentially had religion standing in our way of being happy and together. 
So my new goal in life was to try to show her why her Christian beliefs were silly, mm -hmm. that she should put all this nonsense behind her, and why we should be happy together. And if I was going to be criticizing Christianity, at least I needed to know what Christianity teaches. And so I picked up a Bible and I started to read about Jesus. And what I found there was a little bit feeling and tasting differently than I had expected. What I saw in Jesus was a person who was speaking with authority and he was maneuvering in conversation in ways that were pretty impressive. He was clearly, he knew what he was talking about and that started to put a little bit of an awkward Uh, fact for me to handle. I knew that at some point I would need to have some account of who I thought this Jesus was, because I I, I, I was the same way when, yeah. when, I, when I when I read uh, uh I before I was a Christian I read Matthew Mark and John and uh, I was really impressed. I was really impressed when I read the words of, of, of Jesus for the same reasons you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and even at the time, even as an atheist, I never really bought into the world. Jesus myth theory. Mm -hmm. I, it never occurred to me that Jesus was a mythological figure in some sort of fairy tale. It seems clear, at least minimally, that he was a historical person mm -hmm. who walked the road of Palestine in the first century. And, so, and that, that, that's that's another parallel, by the way, in that in that when I was reading the Gospels, I'm thinking I'm actually reading uh, first century accounts of, uh, of of the early church, and you know because you you see all kinds of atheists nowadays on you know on YouTube and. Uh, they're so far away from scholarship; they have no clue what they're what they're talking about. And that the genre of the gospel is first-century Greco-Roman yes. biography. Um, so we were on the same page there, and that we're both taking this seriously as early as early accounts of, of yeah. Jesus, which, which is cool historical. because that's that's what scholarship uh, agrees on that's nowadays. Right. So, so we were right. Knowing we were actually on the right path, mm -hmm. but also it seems like his teachings were taken seriously enough, and his impact <laughs> on his disciples was such that they were prepared to say, I've seen this, and I vouch for him. And also, they were then saying that they had seen him from the dead after his crucifixion, and they were ready to go to their graves for the truth of that belief. So at that point, I thought this is at least some set of events that I need to have an account for, and I wasn't really sure how I would resolve this, but I figured at some point I will need to give an account of who I thought Jesus was. But I wasn't, no, I wasn't anywhere near changing my mind at this point, Uh, I couldn't even have ended up in church even if I wanted to because all of my weekends were busy traveling the country to play volleyball games. And so Sunday mornings I couldn't even have visited the church. The thing is that this pair didn't last long because shortly after I started investigating those matters, my shoulder started to fail me. And Your spiking uh, shoulder? Yes, the, okay. the, the, the shoulder of the arm for the spiking. And about 10 minutes into every volleyball practice, my shoulder burned and I just couldn't spike anymore. And so the doctor... And, that, and that's pretty much all you could do. That's on, right. On, since on, uh, on all I could yeah. do was jump, and you can't, if you can't spike and you're a middle blocker, yeah. you're pretty much worthless. Okay. So um, I was off of the label quote. The doctors couldn't find anything wrong with my shoulder. Uh, the physical therapist's best efforts didn't help. And I was basically told, look, you just need to rest your shoulder. You need to stop volleyball for an, a couple of weeks and see where it goes from there. So you need something to do for a couple of weeks. So against my will, I'm off of volleyball courts, and I figured, well, since I've been looking into this Christianity thing, I might as well go and see what those Christians do when they get together. So I got the address of an evangelical congregation in Paris, and on that first Sunday morning without a volleyball game, I took my car and I drove to that congregation. And the way I describe it is really that I went there like you would go to the zoo to see some weird exotic animals that you've heard about or read in books but never seen in real life. And so I went there to just see what those weird animals do when they get together. And I walked into that church and I remember feeling oppressed by the, the clear knowledge that if any of my friends or family could see me there in a church, I would die of shame. And so the whole thing was really awkward and I was seeing these people and um, they looked like they genuinely believed what they were doing. They were praying and they thought that the God was literally hearing their prayers. So the whole thing was awkward for me and I sat down in the corner trying not to m meet anybody and I listened to the preacher and to this day I don't remember a word that the preacher said. I figured I've seen enough so I jumped to my feet <coughs> and walked to the back of the church trying to escape and being careful not to make eye contact so I wouldn't have to introduce myself to any of those weirdos. 
And I reached the exit door at the back of the church, opened it, and I literally had one foot out the door when a blast of chills grabbed me in the stomach, going all the way in my chest and grabbed me by the throat. And I was frozen on the doorstep with goosebumps all over. Anything and like that ever happened before? Not quite. <laughs> and so, but, you know, I, I was there frozen and I heard myself thinking, well, this is ridiculous. I have to figure this out. And so I closed the door in front of me, turned around, and I went straight to the head pastor and said, so, you believe in God, huh? He looked at me. He said, yes. I said, well, how does that work out? Then we can talk about it. And so he waited till everyone was gone, and then we went to his office, and he prayed for me, which I thought was a bit awkward, but at least it was reassuringly consistent. At least he really believed it. And so then we started talking, and we started to answer some of my questions. What is this Christianity thing? And he, he was a man who didn't have necessarily a formal training in apologetics or providing good arguments in favor of Christianity in the way that you and I now know, too. But he had consistent answers within his own worldview, and that was impressive in its own right. He was a man who clearly wasn't out of his mind. And he was, uh, he thought on his feet, he was educated, and yeah. he thought that God existed and that Jesus was raised from the dead. And, that, that, and that's important because uh, this was a problem I had when I, when I ran into a Christian who actually knew what he was talking about, that I, I was shocked, right? I, any discussion with a Christian should be a massacre, right? Should. I, I should just slaughter this person. Yeah. And so when you when when I didn't, it was what's what's going on here, right? Because I, I thought all of these guys were just complete morons, and here's yeah. someone who, who who isn't. Yeah, and so I wasn't necessarily aggressive with that person, but I was trying to understand how these views make sense. And he just had coherent answers, and he was essentially explaining me what Christianity is. So for a number of weeks after that, I just we made appointments to come and talk with him, and we just exchange on the ideas of Christianity. He tried to slowly walk through the basics of Christianity, gave me a booklet that he had written that um, encouraged me to ask, that asked questions and pointed me to the Bible to see what the scriptures actually teach mm -hmm. on those matters. And slowly but surely, these various beliefs started to make sense to me. Um, a lot of Christianity started to have coherent sense, but there's one that just didn't register. I couldn't understand at all. And I still have my written notes at home that's written in French about all of my studying on those matters. Every other page I've written this question that didn't make sense. Why did Jesus have to die? It made no sense to me why, what was the connection between Jesus dying and my Christian life if I were to become a Christian. I didn't see the connection. And very soon after, the answer would come. At that point, my unbelief had uh, slowed down a little bit and I was starting to shift my unbelieving prayer life into God, this starts to make sense, but if you're real, I'm going to have need to have you really explicitly reveal yourself to me in ways that I can trust this is real and I can jump in and not making a fool of myself. And the sort of experience I was hoping for, aside from arguably what happened at that church, I was hoping for some sort of open heaven with the voice of God coming down, welcome son. And what came was eventually much less theatrical, but much more brutal. What he did is that he reactivated my conscience. And that was not a pleasant experience. Um, at the exact same time I had started to investigate Christianity, I had come to commit some really sinister misdeeds which I will spare you the story in detail, but even by my own low atheistic standards of morality at the time, were pretty extreme and clearly wrong. And yet I knew I had done those things and all I had suppressed it, and I had piled up all sorts of lies above it so I did not have to face the consequences, and I really had suppressed it, pretending like this never happened. And what happened at, the, at that point is that God just took all of this and shoved it in my face, and I was struck with guilt, intense guilt, like a well, a physical pain out of the guilt. And in that place of being struck with a physical pain out of guilt, there the gospel clicked. This Christian gospel that I had been reading about previously finally made sense. That's why Jesus had to die. Me, that is that he who knew no sin, became sin on my behalf. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin that I deserved. So the switch that Christianity teaches is that he didn't deserve to die. I did deserve the 
punishment, the wrath of God was yet poured on him, and I received it freely, not by any works or rituals or any good deeds that I would perform, but simply by placing my trust in him, thereby receiving salvation. So the teaching of Christianity that heaven is given for free, not by good works, but by faith, finally clicked, and I received it. I said, this is making perfect sense now. God, I'm receiving this uh, sacrifice that you made on my behalf. I place my trust in you. Save me. And at that point, I experienced this real spiritual renewal. All of that guilt just evaporated. And I felt the freedom. I had been forgiven by the living God. So I had now to confess those things to the relevant parties, and I did so. And now that everything was in the open, I figured, well, this is probably God's will now that those things are out, that I would marry my Christian girlfriend. And so I uh, left everything in friends behind. I quit my job, left my volleyball team and my music band, and tried to move to New York. I found a job on Wall Street since I was working on in finance. That worked out really well. I found a job there, moved here, and shortly after I moved here, it became very clear that it was actually not at all God's purpose for me to be with that woman. We had a terrible relationship, and we broke up. And at that point, I had almost zero social connections in New York. I found myself isolated here with almost nothing to do. I had no volleyball, no music anymore, so I had my job and complete void aside from that. <coughs> the point where I started to try to tell to my family and friends back in France why my jump to Christianity was actually irrational, that I had lost my mind in the process, and we started communicating about the good reasons I had, and I had thought of good reasons. It started to make sense. I was able to explain to them, but I was also very curious to pile up more arguments and more reasons. And so I started to study the materials that I could find, all sorts of lectures, debates, books, and I was going through this material every single night after the office. I loved this time in my life where I would just come back, devour this material, and enjoy every minute of it. And after a few months of this regimen of literally doing all of this, I figured if I'm going to be spending all of my time and all my resources studying Christianity, I might as well get a degree out of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I ended Smart, up applying. <laughs> I ended up applying for seminary. And I um, graduated with a Master's in New Testament Studies in seminary in New York City. Um, shortly after that, I met my wife, this time an American woman who was wonderful for me. And we started a family. We have two babies. And uh, I'm now pursuing a PhD in philosophical theology under a respected theologian in Europe. And um, just about wrapping up my PhD. So that's, in broad strokes, that's how God takes a French atheist who hates religion, who hates God, and slowly but surely breaks all of his defenses, reveals himself to him, reveals the gospel that saves, and makes a theologian out of him. And so, just to tie back into how we started, uh, you had a, a good background in science and, uh, and mathematics, and now a strong background in theology, and you're... you're, you're you're still a Christian? <laughs> yes, that's right. So uh, it's probably not the right place to go into all of the classical arguments that I came to learn about. But it definitely, all of my findings in terms of research for the various additional arguments comported me in the right directions. And the more I was digging into it, the more I realized there's actually really good reasons there. And so it started to be very efficient with all of my atheist friends and family, realizing that the, the gospel made sense intellectually. It was acceptable rationally, and it was also very relevant experimentally because my experience, everything cried out, the gospel is true. I was convicted, my sin was real, the guilt was real, and the answer to my guilt wasn't denial, it was forgiveness. And the forgiveness is that, that Christ brings in the gospel, not by any works of the law, not by our own righteous deeds, not by our religious rituals, but by faith in Jesus, we receive eternal life. That's the gospel, and that's the best news that ever was proclaimed. Oh, sorry, Jay. I put that up. Give me one second. Any thoughts, John? It's interesting, Jay. Um, just one sec here. Uh, you know, there's um, there there's there's a few things there, right? I mean, um. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear people talk about 
um, coming from atheism uh, and, and discussing their motivations um, when they're when they're talking about their their former beliefs. Um, it, in some ways, I think you know I heard him talk about uh, you know that that he you know he felt like there was there's these these raunchy standards of the of the locker room, and you know that he had he sort of um had educational pressures to to not believe right, and I think that's that's really weird. Um, you know it, when we talk about social pressures, oftentimes um, we're talking about you know the very thing that makes us who we are, and you know I think he he. Uh, I think he kind of makes a weird distinction there about how he sort of separates himself from these things, um, as if as if he wasn't you know participating in the actions themselves. Um, and I don't know. It, it seems like a lot of his focus was on the expectations um, placed on him by the social pressures. Uh, so I mean, I I remember he you know he talks about you know. Um, that you know he was he was doing things that were raunchy. Um, I don't know. He made a lot of, of weird uh, statements about um, you know that that he had low atheist standards back in the day, um, and that you know he, he brought up a lot about the idea of of guilt, how he how he found a sense of guilt and interpreted that as his conscience being turned back on. And you know I'm it, those sort of things. While I think can be very compelling to people, um, I think they're very easily explained um, as as internal uh, things that are happening to them internally, rather than rather than something that's coming from an external source or a, a sense being turned on or off in them. <coughs> um, and I mean, the reason I say that is because you know I think of guilt and and shame as as social constructs where we you you gather what to be ashamed of and what to feel guilty about um, from your from the society you're built you're raised up in and I, I don't think it's I don't think it's strange to have a, a change of heart and to suddenly feel guilty about something you were doing but I don't think that's proof of a, a conscience being turned on right I think I think that guilt is an internal feeling and it's it's weird to talk about um, the demonstration of God's realness is me feeling a feeling um, do you, do you see what I'm saying there? I, it's only because I, I know that guilt can come about without it being justified, right? I mean, we can feel guilty for things that aren't actually our fault and we bear no responsibility for. And I, I feel that I feel guilty for things that aren't my fault all the time. Yeah. And so I don't think that this is necessarily a misfiring of our conscience, but it is it is a way that we understand the world and a response to what we see in the world. And so, I you know, I think... I you know I I think it's um it's interesting to talk about 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 that sort of thing. Um, how do I get both of us on, John? Uh, you know, all oh, right. So, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, but actually, my my uh, my girlfriend's just here to pick me up for for dinner, and I'm I really I really did enjoy that. Actually, I, I put it on my watch list again, so I'm gonna go through it again a little more carefully and trying to listen to what he what he said. But I do I do have some some responses to it that you know I think um. It's interesting to hear, and I'd be interested to hear more about his story. Okay. Perfect. But this this has been an absolute pleasure, Jay. I always I always enjoy talking to you, and and I, I want to thank you again for for having me on here. Uh, you too, mate. I always always hundred uh, percent enjoy talking to you, John. Okay. Cool. All right. Awesome, have a, Jay. Have a lovely time. And have a great. Yeah, absolutely, yes. dude. And I hope you feel better, man. I I know I know that cough's been, been taking it taking it pretty hard on you, so I hope you feel better, man. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. All right, dude. Get yourself to bed, all right? All right. Take care, mate. <laughs> Talk to you later, dude. Goodbye. Bye now. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, dear. Okay, folks. It's uh, time to wrap up. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is Jason Burns. Uh, we've been in conversation with two atheists. Uh, we looked at the Proverbs chapter 8, and I played a testimony of a French atheist who became a Christian, and we've heard an atheist response there. So this is Jason Burns, and uh, signing off with the flu. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, it's been good. Um, I'm heavily involved uh, in church life and just getting on with things, and, yeah. You know, God bless you, everybody.
Uh, have a lovely day. Uh, if you're in America, have a lovely evening. If you're in the UK and wherever you are, have a lovely time. It's been great to talk to Joe and John at Dropout. I enjoy these kind of conversations. This is what I enjoy. Uh, having the conversations with people who are just intelligent and friendly and respectful, and that's what it's all about. So I wish you all the best. Uh, check out uh, the theologian who uh, gave his testimony. Uh, I will link um, tomorrow when I get the chance um, to <coughs> excuse me to um, the professor who is lecturing on proverbs. Uh, in fact, uh, you can have a listen to him here. <coughs> <coughs> professor what? Walt K of Media Third Millennium. Proverbs disallow a tidy calculus wherein the righteous are rewarded immediately with health and wealth. As Van Ruin comments, there are many sayings that assert or imply that the wicked prosper. So that's media.thirdmill.org mp3 16 w a l t k e tape 26 mp3. And it's Professor Walt K, W A L T K E, lecturing seven lectures uh, on mediathirdmill.org on the book of Proverbs. Now, you might not agree with everything, he is reformed, and uh, so you might not agree with some things that he says, but persevere and you'll be blessed. And it's good to be with you today. God is good, He is gracious, and He is kind, and He is loving. He is a mighty God, and he is the savior of the world. He came to die upon a cross and gave his shed for those who believe in him. My friends, believe in Jesus. He came down and died for you. He came down and was broken for you. He came down and gave his life for you. And he calls you now to come under the blood of Christ, to trust in him, to find peace and joy and forgiveness, to find your hope and destiny in Jesus Christ. So come, my friend, and believe in him. Come and trust in him. Come and put your faith in him. For he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he loved you and he died for you, and he calls you into his presence by the blood of Jesus Christ. So my friend, trust and believe in Christ. Put your faith in him. And there you will come into the presence of Almighty God. You will know God as your Father through that blood. So come and believe. Come and trust. Come to him. He says, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will give you rest. He, will be, he is the shepherd of his people, and he will be with you today. Trust in him now while you have the chance. Believe in him now while you have the chance. This is not just intellectual knowledge. This is deeper. This is the knowledge of the living God that you can know today. As you put your faith in Christ, who died on that cross and took the punishment for you. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. There is the love of God, my friend. I'm going to read you a hymn. And I ask you to come. Come and believe in him. I'm going to sing a song, a song that I love. And I'm going to sing it to you. And as I sing it, come to know Christ. Come to the Lord and believe in him. <clears throat> I will sing the wondrous story of the side for me. How he left the realms of glory. For the cross on Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray, raised me up and gently led me back into the 
Days of darkness still may meet me, sorrow's path I oft may tread, but his presence still is with me, by his guiding and I'm led. <coughs> 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 He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over, made by grace for glory meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who for me, sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. Come to Jesus today, trust in him, believe in him, put your faith in him, turn to him, give your heart to him. He longs that you will come to him. Come into the presence of God. Know God, the living God who created the world, who created everything by the word of his mouth, the mighty living God. And you can know him right now. You can come and know the living God. But if you don't, you're under the wrath of God. You're under the great judgment of God. I'm not trying to fear you. I'm telling you a truth that he is the God of God. So he is almighty and he is a powerful God. And my friend, I don't want you to fall under the wrath of God. But if you come to the blood of Christ, where he was the wrath that you deserve. And as you believe in him and trust in him, you'll be washed and you'll be clean, my friend. Clean in the blood of Christ. Come now and believe in him and trust in him. Oh, believe in him. Trust in him. Come and put your faith in Christ. Confess your sin. And acknowledge your guilt to do him and turn to the living Christ, the living God. And you'll know peace and joy. You'll be a new creature in Christ Jesus. So come, my dear friend, my dear soul. Do not go to hell. Do not go to eternity. Do not burn in eternity because God is holy. And if you turn away from him, you will go to everlasting torment because he is holy and you're unholy. And you'll be pushed out of his presence for eternity. And you'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But if you come under the blood of Christ, you'll be washed and clean. And you'll be able to to the almighty God and cry, Abba, Father. Oh, come to him now. Turn to him, please. And trust in him. Trust in him while you have the chance. God bless you. If you give your heart to the Lord, find a church where they teach the Bible, where they preach the gospel, where they want to follow and be true disciples of Jesus. Let us know that you've given your heart to the Lord and we'll encourage you. But come and believe in him. God bless you and may you have a lovely day and may God bless your family. God bless. This is Jason Burns uh, signing out. Thank you for Joe and thank you for John that drop out for their kindness to come and debate and discuss with me. It's been an amicable discussion and I really enjoyed it. And I pray that God will bless you two gentlemen and your families. May blessings follow you all the days of your life, both of you, and God bless you all. Take care and uh, hope to see you soon. Any atheist wants to have an academic debate with me, I'm happy to have a formal academic debate anytime on any topic you want. And any Muslim apologist and atheist apologist out there who wants a formal academic debate, I would be happy to do it. But alas, no Muslim apologist and no atheist apologist will take me on because they know they will lose because no atheist has ever won me yet in a formal academic debate. So there may be one day that will take place. But until now, the atheist community runs away. But we have some people who are honest and true and want true dialogue and discussion. And I thank John and I thank Joe for that discussion. And uh, I pray that they be blessed and know the blessings of God. I really enjoy talking to them. So God bless and I uh, hope to see you around some other time. I'm quite busy these days.
um, in, in, sometime. And when I'm on, I'll send you a link. God bless you all, and take care. Lovely to to talk to John, and lovely to talk to Joe. God bless you.